All right, so last time, like, like I said, we, we, we read the entire first chapter, which is pretty short, and we, we got his take on Nietzsche's eternal return, and I was kind of giving him crap for it, and I'll probably do this throughout the book when he mentions the eternal return, because he gets it a bit wrong. Um, it's not that important, though, because even though he gets it wrong, I think he comes to kind of the same conclusion as Nietzsche. It's, it's a little bit less universal of a conclusion, I think, though, than Nietzsche's. That would be the only difference I, I would make. So remember, Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence is that everything that we do in our life repeats again and again in the same sequence, the same succession, all events in history, all events in the universe, they're inevitably gonna happen the way they've always happened, and you're gonna, ha they're gonna do it again and again. And he thinks that if you actually believe that, it would crush you, you'd think, well, crap, I have to do this thing again that I didn't like. But if you had a life that you lived to the fullest, a life that where you had maybe at least one moment of tremendous joy or passion, that you'd be able to accept that, you'd be able to accept the eternal recurrence. And then as he put it, it, it would, uh, it would uh, change you, it might crush you, but again, it might sort of be something you could live with. You wouldn't see that, that demon as a demon, but as a god. You, you would like that, right? So, um, but, you know, the way that Kundera reads it is that he reads it wrong, that when you, if you're able to repeat something, then you get another shot at it, that you can try something different. That's not Nietzsche's point. Kundera is like, no, Nietzsche's wrong. No, he misunderstands Nietzsche. And he's like, well, we only get one shot at things. You know, you can't go back and try, you know, what is it? Tomas can't decide to go back to Zurich. Once he's gone to Prague, he's gone back to Prague. He can't go back to Zurich and see what it would have been like if he would have stayed in Zurich. He only lives once. Nietzsche kind of says the same thing. Even if you are eternally repeating your life, you don't get to change it, right? That's not his theory. You don't get to change it. Why do I say the only difference is that, you, that Nietzsche's theory is more universal? Uh, I was thinking about it. Maybe another way of putting it is that Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's view of the eternal return is, is more cosmological in scope. It's more cosmological, whereas Kundera's view in this novel is more individualized. It's thinking about human, it's thinking about existence on an individual level. And so when Kundera says that you can't live the same event over again, that way that means that you can't test whether or not another choice would have been better. That's on an individual level. But when Nietzsche says that the entire universe repeats itself and you with it, speck of dust, that's what he says in, in that passage we read. Um, it's not just that your life is sort of unable to be judged because you can't try it a different way, but the entire universe has no meaning because it's all a bunch of particles in an hourglass that just sort of like randomly fall through the sift. And then once it's over, they just, you turn the thing over and it happens again. So not only is your life meaningless, the entire universe is meaningless. There is no answer. So I think you know, Nietzsche makes it even more absurd right, than, than Kundera does. So even though I think Kundera gets Nietzsche wrong, he misreads Nietzsche. He thinks that Nietzsche is saying, oh, eternal return means you get to try it over again. Do something, di no, that's not what Nietzsche is saying. He says, you're, it's set in stone. What you did, you gotta keep doing it again, but really it's no different than the way you're living your life now. You do only live your life once, as far as you know. So it really hasn't changed much. What's different is cosmically, like right? you're just this little thing. And, and so there's even no meaning outside of your life. There's no grand narrative that you can turn to. No unifying story that's gonna sort of make it all worth it. So again, even though I think he has a bad reading of Nietzsche, it doesn't really amount to much. It's still, I still think that, it, you know, he's still, he's on the same page as him, but he's thinking of it again, in more individualistic, less cosmological. Cosmology is the study of the cosmos. A cosmology is the theory of the cosmos. What's the cosmos? Well, everything that is, all that is, right? The universe, right? It's a Greek word for universe, basically. So let's go ahead and start. He's still talking about Nietzsche in chapter two, right? We haven't even met any of the characters yet. We're gonna meet all the characters. Well, actually, we're not gonna meet all the characters today. We're only gonna meet Tomas and Teresa. Who else do we meet? There's a third character. I don't spell her name right. Teresa. There's a woman. Sabina. Sabina, right. Sabina is Tomas's mistress. Okay. 
She's the one that has the bowler hat on the cover, right? This funny little round hat. Um, and then we're gonna eventually meet Franz, but we don't meet him until, um, I guess, part three. Franz is gonna show up. And in a way, I'm glad I wrote it this way because uh, I don't know if, if Kundera intends this, but I'm pretty sure he does. In a way, Tomas and Sabina are kind of like the male and female versions of each other, kind of thing. That's my reading of it. I, I, Kundera might have issues with that. It's more complicated than that. They're, they're their own characters. But in a way, the way they live their life, the way they approach life is very similar, right? You know, And same thing with Teresa and Franz. I think they both seem to be kind of the, the male and fe fe female version of one another. And again, that might be oversimplifying it. They are all unique and they all have their own sort of drives, desires or whatnot. But I, I do find quite an interesting parallel between these characters. So we'll meet them in a minute. But again, in chapter two, he's still talking about Nietzsche. He says, if every second our, live, our lives recurs an infinite number of times, we are nailed to eternity as Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. It is a terrifying prospect. In the world of eternal return, the weight of unbearable responsibility lies heavy on every move we make. Yeah, and the reason for that is because we know that it's set in stone. We can't change it, and so we want it to be good. We want to do it right. That's why Nietzsche called the idea of eternal recur return the heaviest of burdens, das schwerste Gewicht. If eternal return is, uh, return is the heaviest of burdens, then our lives can stand out against it in all their splendid lightness. But is heaviness truly deplorable and lightness splendid? The heaviest of burdens crushes us. We seek beneath it. It pins us to the ground. But in the love poetry of every age, the woman longs to be, to be weighed down by the man's body. The heaviest of burdens is therefore simultaneously an image of life's most intense fulfillment. The heavier the burden, the closer our lives come to the earth the more real and truthful they become. Conversely, the absolute absence of a burden causes man to be lighter than air, to soar into the heights, take leave of the earth and his earthly being and become only half real, his movements as free as they are insignificant. What then shall we choose, weight or lightness? Parmenides posed this very question in the 6th century before Christ. He saw the world divided into pairs of opposites, light, darkness, fineness, coarseness, warmth, cold, being, non-being. One half of the opposition he called positive, light, fineness, fineness, warmth, being, the other negative. We might find this division into positive and negative poles childishly simple, except for one difficulty. Which one is positive, weight or lightness? Parmenides responded, lightness is positive, weight negative. Was he correct or not? That's the question. The only certainty is the lightness weight opposition is the most mysterious, most ambiguous of all. So, you know, in a sense, you can, you can frame the entire novel around this question, right? What is better, heaviness or lightness? I maintain that Teresa and Franz answer with heaviness. Tomas and Sabina try to live with lightness. They all fail, right? They kind of, you have to mix them both. It's almost impossible to be fully heavy or fully light. So we'll see how these metaphors play themselves out through, through the novel. But, you know, he's drawing here from Parmenides, and I almost feel like I should pause just for a minute to talk a little bit about Parmenides, uh, because he's, a, he's, a, he's another philosopher like Nietzsche who pops up throughout the novel. Uh, and so let me get all these dichotomies up here on the board first, right? Lightness is positive. Weight is negative for Parmenides. That's the last one, though. Let's go through it from the beginning. So there's light and dark. Uh, there's fine and coarse, warmth and cold, and being non-being. 
But then, not, you know, we're, we're dealing with light and darkness, but the novel is dealing with this last dichotomy, lightness and weight. Lightness is in, you know, not heavy. Lightness and heaviness. Right? Which of those is positive? Right? Parmenides goes with lightness, but Kundera says, is it that obvious? Really, is it that obvious? Is lightness the positive of the two traits? Um, what do I want to say about Parmenides? Well, Parmenides, he's correct, is one of the oldest philosophers. He goes back to like 6th, 7th century BC. And um, he was probably most famous for his pronouncement of the absolute certainty of the one. Okay? Parmenides was what you would call a monist. His philosophy was a form of monism. What is monism? Maybe you're familiar with, uh, the, the, with monotheism. What's monotheism? If you're a monotheist, what does that mean? Monotheist believes what? One God, right? So monism, what's that? Um, belief in one substance. There's only one thing in the universe. Despite appearances, right? It sure seems like there's more than one. Heck, there's this thing, and there's that thing, and whatever this thing is, full of all sorts of other weird things. What the heck is this? Magic spell or something like that? Hey, these are all different. I'm definitely not that little wand, right? But for Parmenides, that's an illusion. Uh, in reality, we're all one. And uh, this is something, you know, this is, this is a theme that you find through some of the world's religions. Some of the world's religions, like, you know, I've mentioned Buddhism before and, and Hinduism. Certain philosophical schools within those traditions are monistic. And they think that we're all part of this one being. It's all God. And, you know, religion is, so they're monotheistic and they're monist. To, sort of together. Um, but why does he believe in the one? We don't really know much about Parmenides because all we have left over from him is a poem that he wrote, a very, you know, pretty short poem. But it all kind of comes, it seems to circle around this notion of non-being or what you might call nothing. He denied that there was such a thing as nothing. In fact, he, I think he only uses the word once in order to say, never use it. Don't ever say, do not speak of no thing. Do not speak of non-being. All that is, is being. And so, why not? What's wrong about referring to non-being or nothing? What's wrong with that? Remember, negation is the god of the existentials, says Kavu. Negation is our god. When we negate, when we make ourselves a lack of being, like Sartre says, I lack being this. I want to become it. I lack being a good athlete. I want to practice and get good at my skill. I lack being a good teacher. I want to learn the, uh, the, the material so I can teach it well. I lack. Negation is a good thing. But we must avoid it, says Parmenides. It's absurd. Not in the, the uh, Camus sense of absurd, but absurd in like the normal sense. It just doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense to talk about nothing? What is it? It's not a thing. If you talk about something, then that assumes that it has some existence, right? So if you refer to nothing, then you're referring to it as if it were a thing, and that doesn't make any logical sense, so just forget it. Forget it, okay? Don't, don't talk about negation. Don't talk about negative. It, and, and how does this lead to monism? How does this lead to the one? Well, he basically says, well, in order for there to be more than one, there'd have to be nothing. What? Well, there'd have to be a place where, like, let's say I'm one thing and you're another thing, okay? Well, then there has to be something in between us, but what is that thing, right? And there has to be something between that, what is that thing? Well, there'd have to be, let me try it another way. There'd have to be a place where I stopped, there's like an outline, I guess you can see my body, there's like a border, and then there was just nothing, a vacuum, emptiness, and then a new thing began. And he's like, that can't be true because nothing doesn't exist. I hate to say it that way, but there's no such thing as nothing. There's no such thing as a vacuum if you want to talk like a physicist or something. So, and, and kind of this sounds crazy, but in a way it's kind of true. I guess physicists kind of think of this way, that all, all substance is all together. I guess in space there's a vacuum, but you know, when you're on earth, there's really no gap between stuff. There's just sort of like 
I guess, levels of intensity, right? There's, you know, certain parts of, cer certain matter is more dense than others, but there's no place on earth where there really is literally not a thing. It's all got oxygen and air, something, you know, takes up that space. So in a kind of weird sense, he was right, but not for the reasons he thought. You know, he's, he's just using abstract arguments and he's just like, well, talking about nothing doesn't make sense, so I'm going with being, I'm going with the positives, forget about the negatives. And he assumes lightness, being light, lighter than air, is the positive. Being heavy is the negative. And then Kundera uses the metaphor of the woman being, you know, heavy, you know, but being satisfied or whatever, right, in sexual intercourse. So maybe it's a positive thing, right? Maybe, maybe Parmenides is a more masculine way of looking, and then the, 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 the one that chooses heaviness is the more feminine. I don't, I don't know. That's a bit of a stretch. Because uh, I think, again, I think that in the novel you'll find that Teresa and Franz are looking for heaviness. They want heaviness. They want solidity. They want, they want um, an answer, a final answer. They don't care about that, Tomas and Sabina, it seems like. They live light, lightly, freely. They don't want to be burdened down by a weight. Um, so again, this is interesting. These are interesting dichotomies that play themselves out. And even this one too, the, the last paragraph of the book I read last night and it really struck me. I was like, that's a weird way to end this book. How does this play in? And I think it plays into this metaphor of not lightness and heaviness, but lightness as in brightness and darkness. There's this metaphor of going from dark to light or going from light to dark. And so which one is better? Is it better to go from light to dark or from dark to light? And see, it seems like Sabina wants to go from darkness to light. I think Talmas too, but the, they want to go from lightness to darkness. You know, they want to shut their eyes and, 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 and be in this deep, soulful world that has a heavy burden or something like this. So um, what's the story basically? There's really not much to it, right? Like, wh what, what happens in the first two parts of the book as far as plot? What's it all about, basically? What's the main... Thomas and Teresa, right? And what, and what, what's, they, they fall in love, kind of, if you want to call it that? I guess Thomas, he really doesn't want to want to fall in love. Right. He kind of does. He kind of can't help it. It's like inadvertent. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what I call it, love at first sight, but there's this almost like, she just knows that there's this connection. Yeah, there's something there. Right? Mm -hmm. What was it about him? I, I don't know if you get that that early in the book, but there were, I think maybe it's later on you learn about what it was about him that she liked that kind of struck him as a part of the secret brotherhood. Did you get that? Is that in the part two, the secret brotherhood? He was reading a book. Yeah, and she's like, oh, he reads. He's one of those types, right? The secret brotherhood of people who read books. She was reading Anna Karenina. I guess it's not in part two. You have to wait till you get to like part five or whatever. Yeah, because it's going to retell the story even again, right? You get, you get like, you know, it keeps, you know, adding and adding layers to it, right? Um, yeah, but it opens up. I guess the second, the first part is really about Tomas. Like he's kind of the focus of part one. Therese, I guess, is sort of the focus of part two. And it opens up with him just sort of looking out at his, uh, you know, across from the, uh, uh, yeah, his flat, you know, his apartment. He's just looking out the windows and he just, he's not really knowing what to do, right? Um, you know, he's, he's asking himself, right? What am I gonna do with this woman who's just kind of shown up, right? And, and he's asking, you know, standing out the window trying to call the moment to account. Was it love? This is the bottom of page seven. Was it love? The warm feeling, or sorry, the feeling of wanting to die beside her was clearly exaggerated. He had seen her only once before in his life. Was it simply the hysteria of a man who, aware deep down of his inaptitude for love, felt the self-deluding need to simulate it? His unconscious was so cowardly that the best partner it could choose for its little comedy was this miserable provincial waitress with practically no chance at all to enter his life. Looking out over the courtyard at the dirty walls, he realized he had no idea whether it was hysteria or love. What was it exactly though, do you think, that made him so endeared to her when she came to visit him? What happens to her? How, what is her first encounter like? She's sick, right? 
Yeah, and you learn that she's kind of like faking it. She was sick the whole time, but she like wants to make love, right? As soon as they get in the apartment, they have sex. But once it's over, she's like, she lays in bed. She's like, oh, now, now I got a fever. And in a way, that kind of trapped him, I think. That's what made him fall in love with her, that she got sick. Cause he looked at her in bed, he got on his knees and started nurturing her and was like, and he, this is my little baby, you know? And he kind of compares her to, he kind of compares her to Moses, right? My little, you know, she's Moses and I've got to save her. She was putting a little basket put down the river and my little Moses, Moses was a great man. Maybe she'll be great. I have to protect her, right? Uh, he was distressed in a situation where a real man would instantly have known how to act. He was vacillating and therefore deprived Sorry, depriving the most beautiful moments he'd ever experienced, kneeling at her bed and thinking he would not survive her death of their meaning. He remained annoyed with himself until he realized that not knowing what he wanted was actually quite natural. We can never know what to want because living only one life, we can neither compare it with our previous lives nor perfect it in our lives to come. And so again, he's, he kind of blows this moment I guess in retrospect, he realizes that this was a beautiful moment in his life. And he guess fails to heed Kurt Vonnegut's advice and stop and say, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is, right? He's still thinking, oh my God, like I'm falling in love. Should I fall in love? This is not me. I'm a, I'm a player. I'm a, you know, I'm a womanizer. No, no, no. Uh, no, and it kind of spoils the situation. Was it better to be with Teresa or remain alone? There's no mean of, means of testing which decision is better because there's no basis for comparison. We live everything as it comes without warning, like an actor going on cold. And what can life be worth if the first rehearsal for life is life itself? That's why life is always like a sketch. No, sketch is not quite the word because a sketch is an outline of something, the groundwork for a picture. Whereas the sketch that is our life is a sketch for nothing, an outline with no picture. Einmal ist keinmal. That's a phrase you're going to hear a lot through this book. Einmal ist keinmal, says Tomas to himself. What happens but once, says the German adage, might as well not have happened at all. If we only have one life to live, we might as well not have lived at all. Right? Yeah, so einmal ist keinmal. That's actually, that, that translation is a little bit wordy, right? It's more like one time is never. <laughs> like that's kind of a better way of saying it. Um, so again, right, this is a conundrum that's gonna come out throughout the book. They all have to make these choices and they can never know for sure whether it's the right choice, right? It's a sketch, but a sketch for nothing. No basis for comparison. All right, chapter four. Let's go to the bottom of chapter, page, page nine, chapter four. Uh, let's see. So she's, she's got a copy of Anna Karenina under her arms when she arrives in Prague. Who knows the story of Anna Karenina? This is a novel by Tolstoy, the Russian novelist. And it's a tragedy. Later on, you're gonna hear about Oedipus the king from Sophocles. That's another, another tragedy, right? Oedipus. We'll talk about Oedipus when we get there because that's an important part of the later chapter, chapter four, or part four. No one knows Anna Karenina, what that's about. It's a long book. It's actually about two different people, but no one ever talks about the other character. They always talk about Anna Karenina because her story, her story's more exciting. The other one's like some guy trying to find a good wife and then he finds her, <laughs> like his struggles, you know. But she's already married, Anna Karenina, beautiful woman, very beautiful. Um, her husband is very uh, uh, successful, influential uh, government bureaucrat of some sort. It's been a long time since I read the book, so I don't, I'll probably get some of the details wrong. But the main thrust of the story, she meets this man, um, Vronsky who's a colonel or general, he's pretty high up in the army, the Russian army, and she falls in love. They both fall in love with each other, right? Madly, deeply in love. But she is married and she has kids. 
and but she doesn't really she's not really in love with her husband the problem is she's living in Russia in the Victorian era and you can't just go get a divorce. In order to get a divorce, you have to have your husband's permission. But Vronsky thinks that he can somehow with his influence get a divorce and he convinces her to leave her husband. He thinks he can kind of cut through some red tape and he convinces her, you know, come with me, I love you, I can't live without you. I'll do anything for you, you know, forget about that. So she leaves him. And what happens is it completely crushes her, right? That she becomes an outcast in society. No one will talk to her. Her friends call her all sorts of names, you know, tramp, you know, this sort of thing. They, don't, you know, take, they take the side, obviously, of the husband. Uh, and she's, she's separated from her children, right? So she can't see her children. And the, the last scene of the book, in fact, it opens like this. this is, they mentioned this in the, the novel. The opening, there's, there's somebody, uh, I think they, they commit suicide by jumping off a train at the train station and Anna Karenina is very distraught and Vronsky comes to comfort her and then you know they had this moment. She does the same thing at the end of the novel, right? She kills herself by throwing herself off the train, right? So yeah, I'm really not sure. I think Oedipus, it's pretty obvious how that kind of fits into some of the trajectory of this novel. Not really quite sure, but tragedy, I think, again, it's, it's a theme of the book, right? That, that tragedy is... There's some beauty in tragedy. There's happiness in sadness, right? This kind of paradoxical uh, um, affirmation. So, um, again, let's go back to the bottom of page nine. This is chapter four. Only two days ago, he had feared that if he invited her to Prague, she would offer him up her life. When she told him her suitcase was at the station, he immediately realized that the suitcase contained her life that she had left it at the station only until she could offer it up to him. The two of them got into his car, which is parked in front of the house, and drove to the station. There he claimed the suitcase. It was large and enormously heavy, and took it and her home. I think the suitcase is a metaphor in a way, right? Why does he mention that the suitcase is heavy it, and it contained her life? There's a couple things going on there. She's giving her life to him, one. And what's her life like? Heavy. It's heavy, right? She's heavy, right? He's light, she's heavy. So her whole, her whole life is in the suitcase. And it's like, jeez, <laughs> wow, I've got, I've got you now. I can tell, right? Um, skipping forward a little bit, he says, he himself was surprised. He acted against his principles. <laughs> ten, 10 years earlier, when he had divorced his wife, he celebrated the event the way others celebrate a marriage. That's like my dad. <laughs> he understood he was not born to live side by side with any woman and could be fully himself only as a bachelor. He tried to design his life in such a way that no woman could move in with a suitcase. That was why his flat had only one bed, even though it was wide enough. Thomas would tell his mistresses that he was unable to sleep, to fall asleep with anyone next to him and drive them home after midnight. Yeah, there's another thing, he's got, he seems to have this insomnia, which is partly feigned. But again, I think again, lightness, right? He's sort of light, doesn't like the dark. He opens his eyes when he's making love, doesn't close them, right? Some of the characters do, that's a distinction that's, that's made. Uh, and again, he's, 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 I guess, Camus' absurd man. I don't want too many attachments, right? Let's have some fun, but go home afterwards, sort of, sort of thing. I can't sleep with someone's, I'm just not, not, not personal, but you know, I just, I can't fall asleep, but I gotta get to work early, so. It was really lovely, but I'll see you in a few weeks, right? That's sort of his, his MO. But she, uh, she tricked him, I guess. She, she got into his life, right? She brought that suitcase. But this time, he did fall asleep by her side. And this also becomes important, right? Uh, them, them falling asleep together. This is, I guess, so symbolic somewhat. This time he fell asleep by her side. When he woke up the next morning, he found Teresa, who was still asleep, holding his hand. Could they have been hand in hand all night? It was hard to believe. And while she breathed a deep breath of sleep and held his hand firmly, he was unable to disengage it from her grip. The enormously heavy suitcase stood by the bed. So again, right, this, this death grip of Teresa, right? He has to learn how to like, put like oh, some stick there and like sneak off or whatever so we can go to work. 
Again, it occurred to him that Teresa was a child put in a, this is the metaphor, right? The, the sort of Moses metaphor, right? Again, it occurred to him that Teresa was a child put into a pitched out bulrush basket and set downstream. He couldn't very well let a basket with a child in it float down a stormy river. If the Pharaoh's daughter hadn't snatched the basket carrying little Moses from the waves, there would have been no Old Testament, no civilization as we now know it. And how many ancient myths begin with the rescue of an abandoned child? If Polybus hadn't taken in the young Oedipus, Sophocles wouldn't have written his most beautiful tragedy. Tomas did not realize at the time that metaphors are dangerous. Metaphors are not to be trifled with. A single metaphor can give birth to love. I think there's kind of something to that. I mean, I've only been in love a few times, I guess, maybe once, twice. Um, I don't know, did it start in a metaphor? Is it a story we tell ourselves? I almost seem to think that if you've got a pet name for somebody, you're already kind of there. <laughs> <laughs> and that what is a pet name but a metaphor, right? I don't know if it's a metaphor because some people have weird pet names like, you know, Snooky or something like that. <laughs> Isn't Snooky an actual person? Isn't that like a Jersey Shore character or something like that? Sorry, maybe that's an actual name that's been, you know. What, what's her real name? Nicole. Nicole? I guess not. Snooky's not Nicole. That's not, that's not short for Nicole. Um, chapter six. Let's see. The unwritten contract of erotic friendship. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Teresa, yeah, she, she's not too happy with uh, Tomas's infidelities, but he's got, he's got a bit of a, I guess, a system or a morality, for lack of a better word, right? There's this, this concept of an erotic friendship. Uh, and so I guess you know, Tomas has this erotic friendship with Sabina. We'll meet her later. The unwritten contract of erotic friendship stipulated that Tomas should exclude all love from his life. The moment he violated that clause of the contract, his other mistresses would assume inferior status and become ripe for insurrection. Accordingly, he rented a room for Teresa and her heavy suitcase. Right, so he's really avoid this as much as he can, right? It's almost like he knows it, but he's like, ah, no, I wanna stay being this free bachelor. I don't wanna be tied down with this heaviness. But he still wanted to be able to watch over her, to protect her, to enjoy her presence. But he felt no need to change his way of life. He did not want word to get out that Teresa was sleeping at his place. Spending the night together was the corpus delecti of love. So, again, right, the, the mistresses, they, he, he sort of treats them all equally, I guess. Right? What's the, what's the, the when I teach uh, world religions, um, there's a, there's a uh, passage from the uh, Hadith in Islam, because in Islam, you're technically allowed to have more than one wife, but most modern Muslims say that that's wrong, but then they're like, but it says in the book, you can have more than one wife, and Muhammad had like several, and, but what is their justification for why it's not really okay for most of men to have multiple wives? What was it? You can have them, but there's like a, a catch. Like, it's okay to have as many wives as you want, but you have to treat them equally, right? You can't prefer one wife over the other. You have to give them all the same amount of attention, same amount of gifts. And the, the argument is that's impossible to do. So only Muhammad was like a badass and he could do it because he's Muhammad, you know? But like, all oh, you guys, we know you, you're gonna play favorite. So you really can't have more than one wife, even though technically you can't. But he's sort of like, he's kind of like, you, uh, I treat them all equal, right? They, they're all just kind of casual, right? As long as I don't treat one special, then I'm being sort of consistent. He never dared tell them the whole truth, right? So again, he, he sort of kicks them out of his bed so he can go to sleep. And he says it's because of insomnia. He says it's because I can't sleep with someone. He said that, that was half true. But he never dared tell them the whole truth. He said, uh, and then what is the whole truth? After making love... He had an uncontrollable craving to be by himself. Waking in the middle of the night at the sight of an alien body was distasteful to him. Rising in the morning with an intruder was repellent. He had no desire to be overheard brushing his teeth in the bathroom, nor was he enticed by the thought of an intimate breakfast. 
That is why he was so surprised to wake up and find Teresa squeezing his hand tightly. Lying there looking at her, he could not quite understand what had happened. But as he ran through the previous few hours in his mind, he began to sense an aura of hitherto unknown happiness emanating from them. From that time on, they both looked forward to sleeping together. I might even say that the goal of their lovemaking was not so much pleasure as the sleep that followed it. She especially was affected. Whenever she stayed overnight in her rented room, which quickly became only an alibi for Tomas, she was unable to sleep. In his arms, she would fall asleep no matter how wrought up she might have been. Right. So this is something where I think his powers of calming her and soothing her, they, they fail and they start to flag, I think, towards the end of the novel. But this is another sort of thing, right? That she, she has these horrible dreams. Most of them are obviously like based on her jealousy of these other women and sort of her uncertainty of how solid a position she has in his life. But he can always, when she wakes up from these horrible dreams and she's shivering, he can always just grab her fingers and just, shh, and just calm her down and get her right back to sleep. And that brings him a lot of happiness, but he doesn't want to admit it, right? It's a total typical dude, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, I didn't cry during Old Yeller. Yeah. It's like, I don't, it's just a movie. Yeah. You know? I'm not sad. No, that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think what he's saying there is that basically he sort of get he has this room so that I guess if any of his mistresses get all like, wait a minute, you know, who's this Teresa? You, you know, I think, you know, he has this rule of threes. Mm -hmm. He can either sleep with them three times really quick or sleep with them every three weeks. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're getting too attached, right? So if any of his other, other, once every three week girls finds out about Teresa. Well, I, she's just a, she's Moses in a basket. I gotta help this kid. I, I'm renting her a room. It's nothing that serious. I'm just trying to help her get on her feet, right? So I think again, and maybe it's also an alibi for himself, right? It's to help him because he, he feels himself losing control over the situation and he feels himself betraying himself. He's like, I'm this player. I'm this guy that likes to just have some fun and not take things so serious. And now she's making me take things serious. And I think like that, that sort of renting her a room is, is I guess he's, he's, what's the word I'm looking for? He can keep her at a distance. He's keeping her at a distance. That's not what I was looking for, but it was like, I was kicking the can down the road or Preventing the inevitable, we're trying to like, what's well, not preventing, but uh, postpone the inevitable, that's probably a better way to put it. Like, he's got that, but he's, no, I don't, no, no, right? I'm still, I'm still the bachelor, I'm still this guy. Um, so at the end of chapter six, that last paragraph, Tomas came to this conclusion, making love with a woman and sleeping with a woman are two separate passions. So he has, he has sex with Teresa, but he does it so he can sleep with her. When he has sex with the other women, he has sex with them just to have sex, right? So this sleeping, again, what is it a metaphor for? I guess comfort, you know, silence, darkness from light to dark, that sort of thing. Thomas has to make that move from light to dark. He's always in lightness. She's able to bring him to the dark to sort of calm that, right? All right, let's go to chapter nine. This is an interesting chapter where he talks about the, the word compassion. Um, we, we learn a little etymology here, right? We learn a little bit, a little bit of word, word origin. All languages derive from Latin, sorry, sorry. All languages that derive from Latin form the word compassion by combining the prefix with, come, and the root meaning, suffering, late Latin, passio, in other languages, Czech, Polish, German, and Swedish, for instance, the word is translated by a noun formed of an equivalent prefix combined with the word that means feeling. So in languages that derive from Latin, compassion means we cannot look on coolly as others suffer, or we sympathize with those who suffer. French pitié, Italian pietà, etc. 
This connotes a certain condescension towards the sufferer. To take pity on a woman means that we are better off than she, that we stoop to her level, lower ourselves. That is why the word compassion generally inspires suspicion. It designates what is considered an inferior, second-rate sen sentiment that has little to do with love. To love someone out of compassion means not really to love. In languages that form the word compassion, not from the root suffering, but from the root feeling, the word is used in approximately the same way, but to contend that it designates a bad or inferior sentiment is difficult. The secret strength of its etymology floods the word with another light and gives it a broader meaning. To have compassion, co-feeling, means not to be able to live with others' misfortune, but also to feel with him any emotion, joy, anxiety, happiness, pain. This kind of compassion in the sense of susi, I can't pronounce that Czech word, mitgifu, Migansla. It therefore signifies the maximal capacity of affective imagination, the art of emotional telepathy. In the hierarchy of sentiments, then it is supreme. By revealing to Tomas her dream about jabbing needles under her fingernails, Teresa unwittingly revealed that she had gone through his desk. If Teresa had been any other woman, Tomas would never have spoken to her again. Aware of that, Teresa said to him, throw me out. But instead of throwing her out, he seized her hand and kissed the tips of her fingers. Because at that moment, he himself felt the pain under her fingernails, as surely as if the nerves of her finger led straight to his own brain. Anyone who has failed to benefit from the devil's gift of compassion, co-feeling, will condemn Teresa coldly for her deed, because privacy is sacred and drawers containing intimate correspondence are not to be opened. But because compassion was Tomas's fate or curse, he felt that he himself had knelt before the open desk drawer, unable to tear his eyes from Sabina's letter. He understood Teresa, and not only was he incapable of being angry with her, he loved her all the more. Okay, I don't know if I would have reacted the way Tomas did, right? but what does she do and what, 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 what happened? So she had this dream, and she's waking up from this dream. This is the one of all the cats, right? What does that dream represent? She, and the dream gives her away. When she tells him the dream, he's like, wait a freaking minute. You've been reading my letters, right? What letter did she read? Who, who was the letter from? Yeah, Sabina. Do you remember what she was saying in the letter? Something pretty kinky. Yeah, not just that, while other women watched or something. Oh, yeah. And, and so Therese is in her dream. She's watching him make love, and then, like, all these cats come out. And I guess that represents all the other women in his life. This is a recurring thing. Her dreams seem to be, like, a bunch of women competing for his, for his attention to be perfect, to do what he wants, to please him. And none of them really can, you know. And so she wakes up and kind of, like, she tells him the dream. Of being of watching him you know and he's like wait a minute that got into your i know how that got into your mind but instead of being like angry he kind of forgives her for that right because of this compassion right he understands why she did it and he almost feels bad about it he's like yeah i guess i am kind of a scoundrel cheating on her all the time and like yeah she loves me and i kind of love her too it almost endears her to him right but this is sort of like like most people, when they find out their girl's been scrolling through their DMs, you know, or <laughs> boyfriends, but yeah, it's like, what, you jerk, you know, like, what the hell are you doing? How dare you invade my privacy? This sort of thing. But he's making this point that you don't, if you really love somebody, I guess you'll forgive for that stuff. I don't know if I, I don't know if I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm too jealous. I'm just like, no, or, or I'm a private person. I don't know, though. I, I can't think of anything. I'd have to think about it. I probably would eat my words if I was supposed to be <laughs> I can't think of anything on my phone that I'd be embarrassed to show a girlfriend. I just can't. Yeah. So, but I probably have to think about it. I'd scroll through my phone and see what's on there. <laughs> like, uh, let me make sure. You know. uh, like, yeah, sure, look through it. I, I think I'd be upset that they wanted to see it, though. That would be upset me. They'd be like, oh, why don't you just trust me? Just trust me. 
And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm like, well, that's what you have to do. Like, you just have to not know and trust me. That's what love and being a friend is. Like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe everybody that's nice to me, as soon as I walk away, they talk about what a jerk I am. But I have to like, if I like, you know, uh, what am I gonna record everything they say to make sure they're f nice and like me? Like, yeah, you take a risk with people. I don't know. But this is another thing about, yeah, go ahead. Case, didn't she kind of have a reason though? Yeah, she has a reason to be jealous. Yeah, she knows he's a player, right? Yeah, so it's not, and most people have a reason for looking through the person's phone probably, you know, they, you know, they, they might've said something. Like towards the end of the novel, he gets, starts getting letters from his son when they're living out in the country and he doesn't want to tell her about it uh, because of the nature of the letters and the situation they're in. But she catches them a few times, like she walks in on him and he like puts the letter aside and she's like, oh crap, it's one of his old mistresses probably, you know, but it's really his son, you know, this is like, but she still had the right to be suspicious because that was suspicious behavior. But you know, maybe he was like just, you know, trying to hide a Christmas present that he wants to, you know? Like, yeah, she thinks it's always something cynical and nefarious. Like, that's my problem with that suspicion. Like, if I'm in a relationship with someone like that, I'm just like, man, like, I'm sorry, but you think the worst of me, you know? Give me the benefit of the doubt. And if you're, and, and if you are, ask me, you know? Be like, hey, I'm not comfortable. I think that you and her are too nice to each other, you know? And I'll talk to you about it or whatever. Let you see our DMs if you want, but like, to do it behind our back, and like, that, to me, that's, I don't know. But he forgives her because he, I guess because he relates and not in a condescending way, but he's sort of almost like in an endearing way, right? He's like, oh, she did it because she likes me. She cares about me. You know, that's, I think that's part of it, right? Um, and he ends up doing a lot for her, right? I think in a way at the end of the novel, you'll see that she kind of feels guilty about this. She kind of feels bad about it. She feels like, she, her demands were kind of silly and childish and that she kind of just ended up screwing him over, right? Like, he, like some of the decisions he made because he thought it'd be better for her ended up really screwing him over, his career, his, his political standing and all that, uh, you know. But it's, it's interesting because I think what's kind of sad about this book, and I think this book is a bit of a tragedy, I don't know, it. there's all these things these characters feel that they never, they never tell each other. And it's like, I wonder what, how they would have been if they would have been just open, you know, about their feelings. But we, we're so concerned about the other, you know, we care, oh, she's a little baby, I don't want, you know, I gotta protect her. Can't tell her that, because then she'll get, you know, whatever. But, you know, you don't know, maybe you should have told her, and then that would have been a lot clearer, and that sort of thing. You know, Franz, you're gonna find out, he ends up divorcing his wife, and he stays with her just because because of that reason. He's like, it would break her heart. He, he, she wouldn't be able to, like, I'm not, I don't love her, like, but she's a good person and I don't want to break her heart. But then he ends up like breaking up, like leaving her. And then the real wife comes out and she's like, wait, this whole time I could have walked away and you're not even really freaking out about it. And so, you know, we tell ourselves all this stuff that, oh, I gotta be this way because what would mom say? What would dad say? What would boyfriend or girlfriend say? You know, and we assume they're gonna react a certain way. Maybe they wouldn't have. You know? So that's, that's another, I guess, kind of sad, tragic part of the novel is you've got these characters, you know, a lot of them are trying to kind of please each other and get along with each other because they do care about each other. But a lot of times they, there's these mis mixed messages or one of the chapters, words misunderstood, you know, that, that, that they say one thing and it's heard differently by the individual. Um, that's a problem I think we have today, like horribly, when it comes to political speech. You know, people say one word and they completely mean something else from what someone else hears. So I always try to, if I disagree with somebody or if I think what they're saying is just moronic, I at least try to understand what they believe and why they would believe it. Whereas I think there's a lot of people who just fill in the blanks for that. Oh, he just must be this, this or that. That's why they believe it. Well, I don't know, maybe they're, they have a different experience. They watch different news than I do. And that's why, they, you know, I think they're wrong, but let's try to understand where they, got that view, not just they're evil or idiots. That's just, that's lazy thinking. Um, but so chapter 12, we get this other, you know, I guess this might be, I don't know, maybe it isn't, but I think this is maybe the first example where Tomas is doing something that he thinks will please Teresa. You know, he keeps getting this job offer uh, in Zurich, right, in Switzerland. Um, so at the beginning of chapter 12, if Tomas rejected the Swiss doctor's offer without a second thought, it was for Teresa's sake. He assumed she would not want to leave. She had spent the whole first week of the occupation in a kind of trance almost resembling happiness. 
After roaming the streets with her camera, she would hand the rolls of film to foreign journalists who actually fought over them. Once, when she went too far and took a close-up of an officer pointing his revolver at a group of people, she was arrested and kept overnight at Russian military headquarters. There they threatened to shoot her, but no sooner did they let her go than she was back in the streets with her camera. That is why Tomas was surprised when on the 10th day of the occupation, she said to him, why is it you don't want to go to Switzerland? So he's, where he's, he's talking about this moment in her life that, you know, one could argue perhaps is, I wouldn't say her most happy, but maybe the most meaningful, right? She got a job, uh, Sabina actually helped her get a job at a newspaper. She started in the dark room developing film, then she became a photographer. And then when the Russians took over Czechoslovakia uh, and they were sort of just kind of in, uh, instituting communism, into that country, she was taking photographs of all the Russian troops and all these women. This is another image that keeps popping up in the novel, the, the Czech women with their miniskirts on. Why were they wearing miniskirts? They were wearing miniskirts to sort of mock the troops, the Russian troops. Well, apparently the Russian troops were sex deprived. Like they were like, you know, they had to do like three year terms on the field and they didn't go back to their family for three years. So they'd had sex for three years. So this was a way of mocking them, right? The women in the Czech, the, the, I, I was about to say the Czech Republic, but Czechoslovakia, <laughs> this is before there was a Czech Republic. This is before the split, right? This is before, you know, the communists, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, right? This is before the, the end of the, the, the Berlin Wall and all that stuff. This is, you know, the dark, dark days of communism. Um, this is when she, I guess, felt like her life had more meaning. It, it had some heaviness to it that she wanted, it had purpose. I'm important. I'm taking these photos and people are like, give me your photos. And I'm doing something for the cause, doing something for, you know, and, and people want me and they take me seriously. So she's loving this and Tomas is seeing this and he doesn't want to ruin that. Right? He's like, I, I'm cool. I like being a surgeon here in Prague. Sure, the, the job in, in Switzerland is going to be pay more. It's a better opportunity. But, you know, I mean, look at her. She's enjoying herself. But then she's like, why don't you take the job? You know? And she, it turns out she's kind of like bored. You know, after 10 days of the occupation, she loses that feeling. Right? He thinks she's still got it. And he's like, I don't want to screw up this thing. She's really, I'm not as into it as she is. So let her do her thing. But then they end up going, right? Um, on the bottom of page 26, the day she walked through the streets of Prague taking pictures of Russian soldiers and looking danger in the face were the best of her life. They were the only time when the television series of her dreams had been interrupted and she'd enjoyed a few happy nights. Right, so she's, not, she's no longer lost in her thoughts of what could be with her and Tomas and this perfect, like, I don't know, house in the country. She's got her, 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 her purpose in her photography, in the war, in this occupation of the Russians. Like, she doesn't have to stop and think about, what am I gonna do, what's it all about? Because the, 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 the question is answered for her constantly, right? There's already an answer. So for her, this is what gives that life that intensity. But again, this wears off, right, after a while. The Russians had brought equilibrium to her in their tanks. And now the carnival, now that the carnival was over, she feared her nights again and wanted to escape them. She now knew there were conditions under which she could feel strong and fulfilled, and she longed to go off into the world and seek those conditions somewhere else. So all that did was give her a taste, and she's like, okay, this is possible. I can do something that gives my life meaning and purpose and, and a sense of finality, I suppose. It's heavy enough for her, but after a while, it wasn't heavy enough, right? After a while, she realized maybe what she was doing wasn't really having as much of an effect. Maybe if they go to Switzerland, she can find something new. She can expand her uh, horizons. I think Camus would like that move. Remember, Camus is all about quantity, do more. She got as much as she could out of photography. Let's go to Switzerland and see what's there. On page 28, in the middle of the page, this is chapter 13, leaving the hotel of his flat, which by now had acquired tables, chairs. This is, this is them in Switzerland, right? They moved to Switzerland, they gotta sell all their stuff. They're finally starting to fill their flat up with furniture. So leaving the hotel for his flat, he thought happily that he carried his way of living with him as snails carry his house. 
Teresa and Sabina represented the two poles of his life, separate and irreconcilable, yet equally appealing, right? So he, he's got Sabina with him. She lives not in Zurich, but where Geneva, I guess. So she's also in Switzerland and she comes to visit him, but you know, they get a hotel room or whatever. So everything's kind of neat. He's like a little snail carrying his home with him everywhere he goes, right? His, his, his perfect little baby in the basket, Teresa, and you know, his, you know, saucy, artistic, you know, freaky, kinky girl, Sabina, right? Um, they're all with him, right? But the fact that he carried his life support system with him everywhere, like a part of his body, meant that Teresa went on having her dreams, right? She can't get over this, right? She's, you know, he, he can't change it. He's not willing to change it. And she can't stand it, but they can't, they can't leave each other. They're kind of stuck, right, together. Um, chapter 14. Uh, let's see here. What's going on? Okay, this is, she, she comes, uh, you know, my, uh, he paid the bill, left the restaurant, started walking through the street. So this is the bottom page 29. His melancholy growing more and more beautiful. So this is after she leaves, right? She leaves. She goes back to Prague. And he's like, ah, I guess I'm going back to Prague, right? I guess I got to go back. And it's not going to be easy. It's sort of a one-way ticket, right? He's got, you can't go and go back and forth. The borders are closed. You're going to go back, got to stay there. He paid the bill, left the restaurant, started walking the streets, melancholy, growing more and more beautiful. He had spent seven years of his life with Teresa. And now he realized that those years were more attractive in retrospect than they were when he was living them. His love for Teresa was beautiful, but it was also tiring. He had constantly had to hide things from her. Sham, dissemble, make amends, buck her up, calm her down, give her evidence of his feelings, play the defendant to her jealousy, her suffering, and her dreams. Feel guilty, make excuses and apologies. Now what was tiring had disappeared and only the beauty remained. Yeah, that's a, that's a theme that is not just in this book, but that's kind of in a lot of books, right? The idea that, uh, you know, love is, is sort of like, what is real love? I think this was actually on an episode of Louie. Have you ever watched that show with Louie? Kind of controversial because of the, the guy that did it. But he falls in love with this woman and he gets his heart broken and his like ornery old man neighbor sees him crying or moping about and he's like, oh, this sucks. And he's like, that's love. He's like, what do you mean? I feel like crap. He's like, you're lucky. That means you are love. Like this is love. It's not the time you were hanging out with her and having all that fun. You were just lost in the moment. Love is this crap right now, right? It's this sadness, right? That's love, right? But it's a sort of beautiful, right? He's looking, and in a way though, you know, is this all, to use a word that Camus uses, is this all nostalgia? You know, we tend to do this, where we think of our past and we're like, we, we kind of look at our past through rose-colored colored glasses. Maybe not everybody. Maybe people that have had traumatic past, that would be an exception. But a lot of us, you know, we look at our childhood, like, oh, how innocent, how nice, it was so simple back then. We forget how freaking confused we were, right? How annoyed we were, right? Like, life is never perfect, but it always is like looking back. We have these sort of rose-tinted rose glasses and that seems to be sort of, Tomas, right? And then he mentions, I'm gonna skip this part, but it'll come up again, the Beethoven quintet, or is it a quintet? Quartet. Uh, es mus, uh, es sign, right? Musa sign, right? Must I, must, must it be this way? Yes, it must. Uh, for, for Tomas, Teresa is his es sign, right? I have to, I've gotta go back. She's calling me, okay? Um, ya, es sign, Thomas said again. Top of page 33, chapter 16. Unlike Parmenides, Beethoven apparently viewed weight as something positive. Since the German word schwer means both difficult and heavy, Beethoven's difficult resolution may also be construed as a heavy or weighty resolution. The weighty resolution is at one with the voice of fate. Esmo sign, da 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 da. Y'all know fate. That's definitely not the quartet that he's talking about. But 
that's fate, the symphony. The weighty resolution is at one with the voice of fate. Necessity, weight, and value are three concepts intrinsically bound. Only necessity is heavy, and only what is heavy has value. Right? So this is an inversion of Parmenides, right? For Parmenides, lightness was the positive. For the, the German uh, Beethoven, right? This sort of brooding composer, uh, you know, conducting symphonies about fate. Heaviness, that's what gives things value, right? That's how you put, you put things on the scale, right? Lady Justice. This is a conviction born of Beethoven's music. And although we cannot ignore the possibility or even probability that it owes its origins more to Beethoven's commentators than to Beethoven himself, we all, the more, or we all more or less share it. We believe that the greatness of man stems from the fact that he bears his fate as Atlas bore the heavens on his shoulders. Beethoven's hero is a lifter of metaphysical weight. So again, I guess if anything, <clears throat> Teresa is the weight in Tomas's life. The only weight that he's ever really known. Like, he kind of comes off as a pretty bad person in the first few chapters of the book. Maybe you think so even at the end of the book that he's a bad person. Right? How does he treat his first wife? I think she kind of sucked. At least that's how it's that's how it's sort of portrayed. She wasn't a great wife to begin with, but uh, after they get divorced, he tries to be a father. And what happens? She takes custody. She takes custody and doesn't really let him see the son every week that he's supposed to have her. Oh, he can. He makes up some excuse. So after a while, he just gives up. He's like, all right, I'm just not even gonna try then. I'm not even try. I was trying, but I won't even try. And what happens? His what does his parents do? They take the side of the, the wife. They're like, you horrible, how dare you? He's like, I'm just gonna accept it. I've lost my, I, and, and in a way that works out for him because he's a guy that doesn't want attachments. Yeah, but as soon as that's, pretty much like less than a year after that happens, she walks into his life. But I think in a way, it, to me, she's more, it's an authentic draw. It's, it's a more, not as authentic you're gonna find later in the book, the author seems to describe his profession. You don't really learn about that much till later, later on in the novel, how much he loves what he does, how much he loves being a surgeon. And that kind of makes sense. It kind of fits into like his philandering, being like a, you know, trying to have sex with as many women as possible. That's just the way he relates to the human body. That's just the way he sees the world. He loves exploring bodies. That's just his thing. That's just his, his raison d'etre, right? But one cannot deny the pull that Teresa has on him. And so this is sort of his ismo sign, telling him to go back to Teresa, who's fled to, uh, to Prague with, with the dog too. We still haven't talked about the dog. This one is kind of weird. The dog will become a pretty important character in the last part of the book, in part seven. Right? The chapter, or part seven is called Karenin's Smile. Karenin is it's not named after Anna Karenina, but her husband, who was like kind of like this stuffy whatever. The dog is a is a bitch, as he says, right? It's a female dog, but they name it a male name, and throughout the book, it's referred to with the masculine pronoun he he. So unless you remember that one detail at the very beginning, you kind of forget that the dog is a girl <laughs> till the very end when he talks about how she's like on her like having heat or whatever like oh well, that's right it's a girl it's not a guy dog i'm like what like okay it's a trans uh, transgender dog or something like this he's like i don't know what the uh you know what the sim if there's symbolism behind that or whatnot but uh, but he does say that um it was appropriate because as soon as they talk about it oh yeah and then the dog pees on her too right like he, he brings her this dog i guess this dog is supposed to sort of calm her dreams a bit. It's sort of like a proof that, look, I do care about you. We are kind of sticking together. Yeah, I'm still gonna screw around on you. I can't, I gotta have my girls, but like, you're the special one. Here's a dog. This is our, this is our, you know, proof kind of thing. And as soon as he puts the dog on her lap, it pees on her. <laughs> yeah, but she does love the dog and the dog loves her. And that's what he, I think that's why he says it was, is appropriate that they named it a male name because usually a female dog will take after the male master. You know, that's that their nature. But from my experience, that's that's true, right? That like 
female dogs love like the man of the house more than the, it's kind of obvious, they get all excited, but that's not what happens. The dog takes after her, the dog likes her, definitely pairs up with her, likes them both, but it's definitely her dog, right? And she leaves, she leaves uh, 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 Zurich, she goes back to Prague, and uh, you know, he's just like, crap, I, I gotta go. I guess I gotta go. And this really pisses off the guy that got him a job, right? He's really screwed himself over professionally, you know? It's not gonna look good on your career when you take this job. You're there for like a year or two, and you're like, hey, sorry, I'm going back to Prague to a lesser paying job that's not as good, like lower on the totem pole. And they're like, why? I Just because I want to. What? How dare you? He's like, it's because the woman, basically. <laughs> okay, and then the guy kind of understands. He's all right, go get her, boy, or that kind of thing, right? Um, top of page 35, this is the end of part two. Uh, we all reject out of hand the idea that the love of our life may be something light or weightless. We presume our love is what must be, that without it our life would no longer be the same. We feel that Beethoven himself, gloomy and awe-inspiring, is playing esmo sign to our own great love. Tomas often thought of Teresa's remark about his friend Z and came to the conclusion that the love story of his life exemplified not esmo sign, it must be so, but rather es könnte aus ande sein. It could just as well be otherwise. Seven years earlier, a complex neurological case happened to have been discovered at the hospital in Teresa's town. They called in the chief surgeon of Tomas's hospital in Prague for consultation, but the chief surgeon of Tomas's hospital happened to be suffering from sciatica. And because he could not move, he sent Tomas to the provincial hospital in his place. The town had several hotels, but Tomas happened to be given a room in the one where Teresa was employed. He happened to have had enough free time before his train left to stop at the hotel restaurant. Teresa happened to be on duty and happened to be serving Tomas's table. It had taken six chance happenings to push Tomas towards Teresa. And if he had little inclination to go her, on, sorry, as if he had little inclination to go to her on his own. He had gone back to Prague because of her, so fateful a decision resting on so fortuitous a love, a love that would not even have existed had it not been for the chief surgeon Sciatica seven years earlier. And that woman, that personification of absolute fortuity, now again lay asleep beside him, breathing deeply. Right, so now he's back in Prague. It was late at night, his stomach started acting up as it tended to do in times of psychic distress. Once or, tri once or twice, her breathing turned into mild snores. Tomas felt no compassion. All he felt was the pressure in his stomach and the despair of having returned. <laughs> so now he's like regretting his decision, right? He's like, crap, what did I do? Was this really the right choice? I'm back with her. Is this really the right choice? He's, you know, he's torn up about it in his head. Right? And he's thinking about, this is something also that haunts him, you know, you're going to see this throughout the book, the sort of contingency of their love. He just happened to be in that town because his boss happened to be sick that day and he couldn't do it himself. And he happened to go to the one hotel that she happened to be working at that time. Like, he, and he keeps telling himself, I could have been anybody. She was just looking for someone. And there's a scene, I don't think it's in part one, I think it's part two maybe where, is it part one? Where uh, they're at the bar and he doesn't like to dance. She wants to dance, so she comes dancing with the guy. And he's, he's kind of cool at first, but then he starts thinking about it. He's like, look how happy they are dancing. That guy could be me. Like, she just picked me because I just was the right guy. I was, had a book or whatever. Like, like, and he kind of feels replaceable, I think. And he feels like nothing really special, I suppose. So there, I think there's a bit of Teresa in him, whether he wants to admit it or not. Like that's her big thing is her dreams obviously make it like, I want to be enough for him. I want to be enough for him. And the fact that he goes and has sex with other women makes her feel like she's not enough. I can't be com completely enough for him. I want to be completely enough. But in a way, I think Thomas has a similar problem, right? Because he's just like, well, 
if I would have picked her up and like, so somebody else would have, right? Another dude would have done it just as well. You know, she's kind of naive when it comes to love. She's actually pretty intelligent, I think, in other regards. But if, when it comes to love, she's kind of a sucker. And uh, any other dude could have probably got her with, with just enough trickery or whatever, or just the right gentle touch or whatever. And so that, I guess, again, kind of weighs on him as well. But we'll see the story sort of from her point of view. We'll go over chat part two, which won't take that long because it's kind of a review of part one from, from more of the woman's perspective. Uh, but on Monday, I'd, I'd like to try to at least get to meet Franz. I don't know how far we're going to get into part three, but try to read through to the end of part three so we can introduce the fourth main character who we haven't even touched on yet, uh, Franz. And we'll get more deep into Sabina as well. We haven't talked much about her either. So. <laughs>